Building my first ITX gaming PC was way easier and way more fun than I expected. Today, I'm gonna walk you step by step through the process. For the processor, we got the Ryzen 7 7700X on the AM5 platform. A more budget-friendly option would be the 7600X or the 9600X, but since I also edit videos, I wanted a couple extra cores to help with that. Next, the motherboard. This is the ROG Strix B650EI. It's actually my first time ever building on an ITX board. Just look at it. This thing is sick. I've been excited about this one. It's a seriously high-end board. You're getting 10 plus 2 power stages, massive heat sinks over both the VRM and SSD, full Gen 5 support, a bunch of USB ports, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, BIOS flashback, and a ton of other premium features. All right, first we need to release the socket latch so we can drop in the CPU. The processor has an arrow on one corner that lines up with an arrow on the motherboard. There's also notches on the side that only allow it to drop in one direction. Gently lower it onto the socket. Don't press it in. Let gravity do the work. Give it a slight wiggle to make sure it's fully seated. Now when you close the latch, the retention arm will have a lot of resistance. Totally normal, just guide it down and hook it into place. For RAM, I'm using 32 gigs of DDR5 Team Group T4 6000 MHz CL30. This board only has two slots, so there's not much to think about. But if you're using a full-size board with four slots, you typically use a second and fourth slot away from the CPU. Line up the notch on the RAM with the slot. It only goes one way. Make sure the latches are pulled back and pressed down firmly until both sides click into place. Here's a good example of thinking it was seated when it wasn't. If the latch isn't fully closed, give it another push until it locks. Next is the SSD. I went a little crazy with this one. I've been struggling with large 4K video transfers on my old SSD, so I wanted to step it up. This is a crucial T705 2TB Gen 5 SSD, up to 14,500 write speed. I'll be using my old SSD as a secondary drive later. First, remove the heatsink. On this board, it's a big one held by two screws. Just a reminder, make sure to remove the plastic from both the thermal pad and the heatsink if it's a brand new board. Easy step to miss. The SSD goes in at about a 45 degree angle, notch to notch, push it in, then press it down flat. Some boards use a screw to hold down the SSD, but this one has a quick latch, which is way nicer. Then just secure the heatsink back on with the two screws. Now for the CPU cooler. I'm using the Thermalrite Peerless Assassin 120 Mini Black. The thing punches way above its $35 price tag. Amazing performance for the money. If this is your first time, don't let the instructions overwhelm you. It comes with hardware for both Intel and AMD, but we just need the AM5 bag and the matching brackets. First, remove the stock cooler brackets from the motherboard. Each side has two screws. I always recommend using a tray to avoid losing screws. Now grab the four pink spacers from the AM5 bag and drop them over the screw holes. Next, grab the AMD brackets. They usually curve inwards towards the CPU, but double check your instructions. Line them up on top of the spacers, then screw them down. One of my bracket screws is stripped out of the box. If that happens, I suggest exchanging it instead of forcing it in like I did. But I carefully got it to bite and everything ended up nice and tight. At this point, I installed my second SSD on the back of the board, assuming I wouldn't have access to it later. But I found out I actually could, so I removed it before installing Windows. I highly recommend only having one drive installed during Windows setup. I've had issues in the past where Windows puts part of the install on the wrong drive or creates weird partitions. Just simplify it one drive until you're up and running. Let's get the cooler on. Today I'm using Thermal Grizzly. However, KPX Thermal Paste is my favorite. It's been my go-to lately. Thermal Grizzly is great too, but at $10 a gram, it's kind of overkill unless you're pushing a really hot chip. Honestly, even the stock paste that comes with your cooler is probably fine for most people. Just make sure, and I can't stress this enough, make sure to remove the plastic film on the bottom of the cooler before installing it. Otherwise, you'll be tearing the whole thing apart and starting over. The cooler mounts with two screws that attach to the male ends of the bracket we just installed. I recommend starting both sides first, then alternate tightening a bit at a time. Just don't crank one side down first. That can warp the cooler and squeeze all your paste out one side. Also, you don't want to stress the board. Now for the fan. You'll need to attach the metal clips. They just snap into the holes on each side of the fan. You can orient it either way. I choose to have it pull air from the back since my overall airflow is bottom to top, but honestly, either direction is fine. Just try to center it for best cooling. Now clip the fan onto the heat sink and plug the fan cable into the gray CPU fan header. Like everything else, it only goes one way. Normally, this is the point where we would drop the motherboard into the case, but I've watched enough ITX builds to know plugging in the CPU power cable after install can be a nightmare. So let's learn from other people's mistakes and do that now. I'm using the Lee & Lee SP 750 watt power supply. All I'm pulling out for now is the CPU power cable. Make sure the latch is on the correct side and push it in until the connector is fully seated. The edge of the cable should be flush with the plug. Now for the case, we have the Cooler Master NR200. 
This case is pretty old, but it's still considered one of the better budget ITX cases. It's supposed to be beginner friendly for ITX builds, so I thought it'd be a good one to start my ITX journey with. Now again, my supposed new case is as used as it gets. This poor case is missing everything from the accessory box, has a few scratches and marks on it, is loaded with hair, has a couple of extra fans and thermal paste on one of the case cords, and an included IO shield. Now we remove all the panels and remove the power supply cage. This part is pretty simple for an ITX motherboard. We only have four holes, however, regardless of the motherboard size you're using, it's very important to make sure that all the standoffs are installed, or get installed where your motherboard holes are. The biggest thing is you don't want additional standoffs installed in the case that aren't being used with the motherboard, because if they scratch the back of the motherboard, it can ruin it. Now our motherboard has a built-in IO shield, however, if yours comes separate like the one that was on here, make sure to install that first, and then the motherboard. After you have the motherboard in place, you can usually feel it kind of seat itself. Make sure that all the holes are lined up and you can see the standoffs through them. Then install the motherboard. Luckily for me, I have plenty of hardware, but this is another moment where you'd probably want to return the case because the case is what comes with all your motherboard screws. Looking good. I have to say, I'm loving the look of this motherboard. Everything is so compact. Now let's start getting the front panel connected. First, we have the USB 3.0 cable. This is your front USB ports. You'll notice that not only is there a notch on the cable that corresponds with the port, but there's also a hole that's filled because the header is missing a pin. These pins bend really easily. Just make sure you're perfectly straight with the port before putting any kind of pressure, and make sure the notch is all the way seated into the header. Okay, next are the JFP connectors that bother everyone. Now, I don't know if this case came this way or if the last person installed this, but this little adapter that keeps them all together makes it super handy. If you don't have this, I'll show you how to install each one. So there are four pins on top and five on the bottom. Let's start with the top. The first one is your power LED positive or PLED plus. Next is power LED negative or PLED minus. Then the next two are your power switch positive and negative. Now I've been told to put them with the writing up and writing down and both have worked. Not sure if it truly matters, but if your power button doesn't work, just try swapping them. Now we're done with the top row. And honestly, that's the most important part. Now the bottom row, the first two are your HDD LED positive and negative. Most newer cases don't have this anymore. And the two after that, which are under the power switch connector is your reset switch. However, a lot of modern cases now use that for an RGB hub to change colors. So if you don't have that, Either, that's okay. The fifth one is actually reserved, whatever that means, and isn't used. Okay, next up is the HD audio. This is for your microphone, speaker ports on the front. This one is really easy as there's a pin missing and a matching port hole that's filled. It only goes one way and is typically on the bottom left of your motherboard. Now this case doesn't have a USB-C, but if yours does, you'd use this header for that cable. We have our 24 pin header to power our motherboard. Okay, so it's gonna be a lot easier to install the cables we need into our power supply now instead of fighting with it later. First, our motherboard power. This is split into two ends on the power supply side, and they each have their own spot. Now we need to install our two PCI cables and our CPU cable that we already installed into the motherboard. Now we install the power supply bracket onto the PSU and attach it back onto the case. It has two spots where the top can hook on. We need the bottom one for the SFX power supply. Then we need to screw the bottom part of the bracket on. I clearly didn't know what I was doing and I was screwing too many on and was wondering why it didn't fit till I realized it was for the other size power supply. Now that the power supply is in the case, let's start with our 24 pin motherboard cable. You'll notice that part of it detaches. Just do your best to keep it together and installed. Again, it's wildly important that your cables are seated correctly. Always make sure. As you can see, it seemed fine, but part of it wasn't all the way seated. Make sure. Just in time too, the cable management inspector arrived. Luckily, I passed. And just when I thought I was in the clear, another surprise inspection. The micromanagement is real. Now, like I said, I've never built in an ITX case before, so I'm still trying to figure out how to route cables. I wanted to swap out the random fan for two Arctic Slim P12s because I know keeping things cool is an issue with ITX builds. Arctic P12s are some of the best price to performance fans you can get. Now the motherboard only has one fan header and I didn't have a fan hub or anything on hand. So I didn't want more than four fans on one header. So the plan was to remove the small fan in the back and add two different ones on top. If I had another set of Arctic P12s, I would have used those. However, I thought adding a touch of RGB to come through the case would add to the luck a bit. So we just threw a couple of thermal right fans up top. This is a good time to get the power cord extension installed on your power supply. Make sure the PSU is turned to the one and not the zero to be on. You're not gonna wanna open your computer back up to switch that. We need to daisy chain the fans together. First, let's connect the RGB together. It's three pins and it only goes one way. Next is the fan connectors. Just plug these together. Now it's really important to put the fan grills on. We're gonna have a lot of wires pushing up against the fans and we don't want them going into the fans. Here's where you plug in the RGB connectors and our fan header. This is the RGB plug and this is our fan plug. I was gonna hook this up now, but I figured I should get the graphics card installed first. 
Make sure the latch that locks the GPU into the PCIe slot is open. You click it back, and when you push the GPU in all the way, just like the RAM, it will latch back into place and lock it in. We're using an NVIDIA RTX 5070. Now you'll notice on the GPU you have a notch. Make sure to line that up with the notch on the PCIe slot. Also, this case was used, so it didn't come with PCIe case cover, so make sure you remove those depending on how many slots your GPU is. Now after the GPU is locked in the PCIe slot, screw the back into place to secure it. I like to push up on the GPU just slightly to pull all the sag out before tightening the screws down. Next, we have our 12 volt high power connection splitter that came with the GPU. If you have a power supply that comes with a native 12 volt high power connection, I'd recommend using that instead of the splitter for a cleaner look. But in this case, we just have our PCI power cables. I cannot stress this enough, make sure all your connections are plugged all the way in, especially your 12 volt high power connection cable. Now for some cable management. I played with this for a few minutes trying to figure out the best way to route everything. I knew I wanted the fan cables to go around the power supply, but it was just a matter of finding the best placement. Feel free to have fun with this part. I want to take a moment to stress the importance of taking a break if you find yourself getting frustrated. If you want an enjoyable experience, you need to be in a good mood. We're pretty much done. We just need to get the top installed with the fans. So all we have to do is hook up the Arctic fans from the bottom to the daisy chain we have on top. Just plug the fan and RGB into the motherboard and we're good. Now we just need to manage our cables a little bit and keep this as clean and tidy as we can. These Velcro ties are really nice. You don't have to worry about cutting your cables if you need to take them out. And that's it. We did a great job. Cable management isn't the best, but it doesn't look bad. Now you can see why we needed those fan grills for the top. It looks amazing. I'm actually super pumped for this build and I'm really excited about doing another ITX build. Let's get this back together. This bracket really is optional. It's just to mount an AIO. Then we put our side panel back on and now the back. This is where I removed the old SSD to make sure nothing weird happens during Windows installation. Then this panel goes back on. That's it. But wait, let's take the panel back off to make sure everything boots up. Put the power cord in. Beautiful. That RGB in the case definitely adds a nice touch. Great job. Now we can put the panel back on. Okay, so I'm getting the screen because the parts are used, so the motherboard has seen a different processor before. No big deal, just hit Y and we're in BIOS. Before we start configuring everything, let's get Windows installed. On a different computer, go to Microsoft's website and create a Windows 11 installation media. Hit download, and we're going to put this onto a clean USB flash drive. Follow all the prompts, and after it's done installing onto the flash drive, we can remove it and stick it into the new computer. Now, this is what we're gonna see. Hit next, install Windows, and click the checkbox. This is where we can put in our Windows key if we have one. If not, just hit I don't have a product key. Pick whichever version of Windows you have a key for or plan on getting. We're doing Windows 11 Pro. Hit next, accept. Now, this is where you'll be glad you have just one drive. For us, we're just picking our crucial T705 two terabyte, but imagine we had two two terabyte drives. It might get confusing which one to pick. Click on our two terabyte drive, hit next, and install. Now, this will take a while depending on your computer, but after it finishes installing, you'll be greeted with this screen. Just pick your country or region, keyboard layout, skip. Now, if you have Wi-Fi drivers already on a flash drive, this is where you can install them. Or if you're hardline and your motherboard sees it, you can just connect. If not, let me show you some magic. Hit Shift F10 to open up the command prompt and type OOBE backslash bypass NRO and hit enter. Now when we do this again, we have the option of connecting without an internet connection. Now I guess this is getting patched, so let me show you some more magic to completely bypass having to log into Windows. We're going to hit Shift F10 again, and this time we're going to type in start space ms dash cxh colon local only and hit enter. Now we can create a local user and bypass a Microsoft account. Just type in a username and hit next. Now we want to turn everything off here and hit accept. And we did it, we're in Windows. Okay, so I'm hardlined and don't have a connection, which means I need my LAN drivers. Let me show you how to do that and how to get your Wi-Fi drivers if you need them. Go to your motherboard's website and click support. Go to drivers and tools, click on your operating system and download the drivers you need. I'm just grabbing the LAN drivers as I can get everything else on the other computer. Let me show you how to format the drive we just used for our Windows installation. Now we want to extract the drivers onto the flash drive and move it over to the new PC. Now we're back on the new computer, plug in the flash drive and run the setup application as a minister. And we have internet. So the first thing we want to do is update Windows. You're going to want to check this a couple of times. After you finish and restart, come back here and check again. Do this until it tells you there's nothing to update. Next, for me, I pick up Chrome, and after that, we head over to get the NVIDIA app to keep our GPU up to date. Just download it, follow all the prompts, 
And after the NVIDIA app is installed, make sure to download the drivers for your GPU and follow all the prompts. Your monitor will probably turn off and back on. Totally normal, we're good. From here, let's restart our computer again. And this time, start smashing the delete key to go back into the BIOS to enable XMP or Expo. Just as easy as enabling it and hitting F10 to save and exit. You can see what changed. Now, if your computer starts acting up or doesn't restart, which it might take a few minutes, it might even restart a couple of times. But if it doesn't, just go back into Windows normally, or if your computer crashes, then disable it for now. Typically, updating the BIOS on your motherboard will fix that. If for any reason your computer locks up, usually removing the CMOS battery or even just pulling the stick of RAM out will be enough for your motherboard to reset and revert to default settings. If it does load back into Windows, right click on the start bar, open task manager, click memory, and make sure it's running at full speed and you're good to go. Now, if you want, download Steam or Epic Games and you're ready to play. I did a quick time spy benchmark and we got a 20,000 score. This was such a great time and honestly, it's given me the ITX bug to keep doing more. So in part two, we'll be diving into Windows optimizations, tuning PBO2 on this Ryzen 7, and even pushing the GPU for more performance. So you won't wanna miss it, see you then.